Hello and welcome to the Courtright Cast, episode 9. This is a place for a semi-intelligent discussion surrounding everything from science fiction, fantasy, movies, books, everything in between, and whatever we feel like, pretty much. <laughs> my name is Alex Courtright, and I'm joined by my brother Jonathan Courtright, and today we're switching things up a little bit. Usually we go over some of the latest news in Hollywood books movies, etc. But today I want to take a simple topic and kind of just drill down on it and discuss. So the topic of the day is going to be what exactly happened to Peter Jackson. Now to break that down, I feel like Peter Jackson's had a really interesting career. And if you're a fan of the director or you've been following what he's working on, it seems like he's in kind of a weird place at this point. He's kind of late in his career, and there's kind of a question as to where he's going from here, because he's been in kind of a place of limbo, not really directing any major feature films in the past few years. So we're just going to kind of start from the beginning, or at least his rise to fame and power with The Lord of the Rings. Um, so Peter Jackson got the gig of The Lord of the Rings after directing how many films? Like three or four low-budget horror movies. Yeah, just kind of... It's so weird They're to sort of like cult classic Yeah, like it's, it's, it's a really interesting dynamic to begin with that you can go from directing kind of cult classic movies to, like horror movies, to The Lord of the Rings, one of the most grand epic fantasy adaptations. And probably, I would say... In most people's opinion, the best fantasy adaptation in a in a trilogy format, at least, ever of yeah. of, of, of a fantasy novel. So it's, it, I feel like the trajectory of his career was probably unexpected, even for him. Obviously, no one really expects to get to direct the Lord of the Rings and mm -hmm. to win like three thousand Oscars from it. But um, I don't know. It's it's. It's such an anomaly to try and study because you see that uh, I wouldn't say a lot, but you see that sometimes where like these indie directors or horror directors kind of get thrown into these new roles for blockbuster films. And you're like, wait, where did they come from? Mm. It's really interesting how they cross genres. But um, one one thing is, I don't know if you know this, but before he got the role or the role, he got the gig as director in Lord of the Rings. He was actually offered King Kong. He was, I believe he oh, was, I um, he wanted to do that one first, but it kind of got shelved by the studio because he was still an up and coming director. And then um, kind of while that movie was in limbo, he got offered Lord of the Rings. It was only after the success of Lord of the Rings that the studio came back and was like, hey, wait, can you give us that King Kong movie we were talking about? Um, but one of the inter most interesting things about Peter Jackson's career to me and it leaves me scratching my head a lot is the inconsistency of the films. Right. Um, and there's an explanation for a lot of that, at least in my opinion. Um, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today is the explanations. And then also where we're left scratching our heads, uh, because we can just start with the Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings was Peter Jackson's film, but, and it, most of his work since the Lord of the Rings at least is like this, but, um, it was also very much his dynamic duo of uh, Fran Walsh and Philip Boyens, which I believe he's married to Fran Walsh. Yeah. They write, a, they wrote all of the Lord of the Rings movies. And from what you gather from all the extended edition, um, you know, Blu-ray behind the scenes footage and so forth on the Lord of the Rings is that Peter Jackson was the visual guy. He was, he could direct actors and he could really get these gorgeous sets and he could he could direct the production like any like all directors could um but that he i would i would say <laughs> i think they literally say in some of the behind the scenes footage uh it's either fran or philippa that it's, they say like we we do all the script writing and then he comes in and says this is how the big battle is gonna go <laughs> this is this is how the fights are gonna go and the armies and the 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 big set pieces and um obviously they're all gonna have a hand in all that respectively it's not gonna be just uh, one note, but um, I kind of thought when he did later movies after the Lord of the Rings that maybe where he might have been a little less consistent or um, there might the, there might have been less quality to the script. I kind of thought that maybe that would have had to do with the lack of Fran Walsh or Philip Boyens. 
But then you look into it and you find that they're attached to pretty much everything he's done since the Lord of the Rings. So one of my biggest questions and the head scratcher that I have is where the inconsistency comes from is, you know, because it's not just that the Lord of the Rings is so good that just 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 to say that like the Lord of the Rings series is like, oh, it's really good is not doing it justice because and I know uh, you might not be as deeply involved in Lord of the Rings as I have been in the past um, with, I guess, just uh, following the production of the films, the the books, uh, Tolkien's life and his intentions. But the adaptation that they did of those movies was so, so true to Tolkien's vision. Just, I mean, obviously Hollywood's going to get involved at some point. It's not going to be absolutely perfect. It's not going to be absolutely true to every beat of the book. But I've never seen a director do such a good job of adapting a book. And the way that he adapted the book for me was there were there were times when he would deviate from the books. And I found myself going like agreeing with the decisions that he made every single time. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's just, I I think that he did that series justice in every single way. I think it's beautiful and perfect in just about every single way. He even, even down to its few flaws are to me, they're just so endearing. Like Mm -hmm. everything really came together with that. And you could chalk it up to it being just kind of like a magical piece, but how, how does a trio of Fran, Philippa, and Peter Jackson put together such a masterpiece that was so, I mean, they were on a, they were on a roller coaster. They were filming. I mean, I don't know that I've ever, that it may have been done before, but it was not common to film movies back to back to back in that way too. Yeah. And somehow they pulled it off. Like how did they pull all that off to begin with? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, Lord, of, just the whole trilogy was, really like a lightning in a bottle moment that I don't think anybody ever thought any series was going to recapture in that way. Like I, I do, I think the key, my key issue with Peter Jackson is that he can't pace a movie to save his life. Like even the Lord of the Rings movies, which I, I think are fantastic. All three of them have massive pacing issues for me. Um, maybe the, I, I actually have never watched the extended editions all the way through. Maybe those, maybe those fix some of that. But the two towers, like there are areas where that movie really drags to me. Um, And it's kind of that way with all three of them. But the moments that work so well in those movies are so perfect. Mm -hmm. Like the ending of the Fellowship of the Ring, like the entire last hour of that movie is just perfect. Yeah. The entire last like two and a half hours of Return of the King (laughs) is just perfect. Like there's so many like stretches of just like this is incredible like the end of the two towers that whole battle scene Mm -hmm. is just incredible and you know like this is never going to be recaptured like and this was like it was something really special and i think i think a lot of his later movies like king kong and the lovely bones especially the the three hobbit movies seem to show his flaws that were present in lord of the rings but were mitigated by how good so much of it was Mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. And, and I think there's an explanation for those later on, which we'll get to. Um, But in regards to the Lord of the Rings, uh, one of the things that I think is his strongest suit and he tends to lean into it, but I think with some of his other productions, he's struggled to capture is uh, that he's truly such a passionate director. He's, he's very visual. He's, he's very good at capturing what he wants to capture in the things that he truly loves. And he's very, what that, what that leads to, to me is for him to be incredibly self-indulgent. And I think with the breadth of the material that you have with Lord of the Rings, I think what it did was it bought him the ability to be that self-indulgent because Tolkien was so self-indulgent that it didn't feel like it was Peter Jackson doing whatever he wanted. It felt like it was him being true to the books, Mm -hmm. which is why I think in other book and other movies that he's done, it becomes a bit more of a glaring issue or it becomes tired a little more quickly um, because the adaptations, I mean, they Fran and Fran Walsh and Philip Boyens claim to be, they were working on the Lord of the Rings script the day before they were shooting consistently. And they were on, I mean, and they were living in hotels, like staying up late, reworking scenes 
night after night after night. Like it, it just sounds like the most like like you said, lightning in a bottle, intense experience that you would think maybe it would be hard to capture again. Obviously, it was really hard to capture then, but I don't that doesn't exactly mean that. I mean, he's done obviously the Hobbit trilogy since then, but even his solo movies or other works like the quality dip is just really hard to understand. Yeah. Well, um, and and that's really just King Kong and the lovely bones. I think those are the only two Yeah, and it's, movies outside the documentary, the, the world war one or two. Yeah. Documentary. And, and we'll get to those as later on. But so right after his, uh, right after the Lord of the Rings, I could go on for hours about Lord of the Rings, but there's plenty of footage on that online. So I'll try to contain myself. Uh, but so after the Lord of the Rings, him going into King Kong, um, you know, I think that's a movie that gets forgotten quite frequently. Um, not that it's should be like remembered that much. It's hard to say King Kong, in my opinion, and you can correct me on this or pose, uh, your conflicting opinions, but I think that King Kong is a lot better movie than it gets credit for. And I think it's more iconic than a lot of the movies coming out today. That movie, you know, King Kong, the original uh, concept for him doing it was, like I said, it came before he got the Lord of the Rings gig. And then he came back to it when the studio kind of saw that he got big and he had a lot more uh, pull with his name and they did it. Now, he wanted to do that because he was such a fan of the original. And you'll notice this is a through line through all of his works is that he tries, he doesn't just try, he, he does not do a movie if he's not passionate about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can point that to, uh, he was offered Aquaman. It was, um, who was it that got it? It was James Wan that Mm -hmm. got Aquaman. Um, but he was offered Aquaman like three times. Like the producer or studio was like texting him like, so do you like Aquaman? And he was like, but his, his, he turned it down because he said he just didn't have interest in Aquaman and he only wanted to do projects that he was truly really inspired and in love with. And, um, King Kong is one that where that was actually the case. He really loved the original. And, um, the, the way that his King Kong was such a love letter to the original King Kong, I think is really beautiful. Well, so also Skull Island was, um, it was a heavy deviation from the mm-hmm. classic King Kong story, whereas Peter Jackson's was different in some ways, but it was in some ways like almost slavishly. Yeah. And, and I think it was because of the the homage he wanted to pay to the original, yeah. which is why I think that obviously King Kong is doesn't have the pool of the source material that Lord of the Rings did. And it's not, you know, it's not as big. But um, I do think that we do him a injustice by kind of glazing over King Kong on his career and some people even knocking it or not liking it. Um, the visual effects were revolutionary at the time. Um, they were, they still, aside from that one scene that you always see get posted around with like the, the stampede of dinosaurs, <laughs> the visual effects in that, in the action sequences are truly great. I mean, the last like hour of the movie, I mean, you can say that it got slow. You can say this, but I mean, that's Peter Jackson. That's the love and care that he's putting into these movies. That's the way that the Lord of the Rings movies ended. They were very slow, drawn out and dramatic endings. And I really appreciate that in in King Kong. I thought that visually the way that he captured King Kong on the tower and the planes flying by and, you know, the the whole essence of King Kong was so beautiful to me. I thought that what he did at making the um the natives of the of Skull Island they were absolutely terrifying i had nightmares as a child about about those people um the sacrifice scenes um all the monsters the prehistoric monsters that were on uh, Skull Island i thought that he really captured a lot of things that i think we all just take for granted yeah in the movies he he captured I mean, the, the, one of the main problems with all of his movies, and you could even say this with The Lord of the Rings, so I think it always just gets a pass with The Lord of the Rings because it's so beloved, is that he he always tends to have a little bit of bloat to his movies. They're yeah. always a little bit bloated, and they always kind of wonder. To, to me, that's the that is the key issue with King Kong. Like, I don't I don't dislike King Kong. Like, I don't think it's a bad movie. I just think it's 
I think it's okay. I think there's parts of it that are really great. I, specifically, like the you know the end where they kill King Kong is really visually striking, and uh, parts of it really like I've only seen the movie maybe twice. His relationship. And the first time I was really girl, young when I saw when he's it. getting to know her and they're playing and yeah. he's kind of falling in love with her is really. But there, really there are touching. moments that stand out that that have that have stuck with me. However, like there's long stretches of that movie that feel like they're going nowhere especially towards the beginning and especially with how drawn out the ending is but i guess it's also where it, it does deviate a little bit from the king kong story but it's also in the important areas it's so um it's so close to how king kong had been done before mm. that it almost feels like okay so it's three hours long and a lot of the main chunks of the movie are very similar to the past I versions think, uh and while like visually it is it's it's incredible at times I, I it feels very big very bloated and pretty hollow by the end of it so it's like there there are sections of the movie that i think work really well but i think as a three-hour whole it's not see, it, it just doesn't I work think to me if there had already but, been a remake close to it in the way that kong skull island has come after it I think that that would be a bit more viable of a criticism. Um, but I think because it hadn't been done on that scale before with new technology, with the way that cinema is these days, I think that it gets the pass on being true to the original and retreading it because I feel like it really paid respect to the original. I don't feel like it was just like he was just like copy paste. I think that it was such a labor of love for him that I personally I wouldn't say like it's like I just adore the movie or love it because I'm not a massive King Kong fan, but I thought that it really accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. Mm. And I thought it was incredibly impressive and immersive. And I think that's what he does so well is uh, world building, w building these beautiful uh, worlds and filling out the cultures and the um, the characters, which I thought he did really well on in that movie. Um, and I say filling out the characters because he filled out the characters so well in Lord of the Rings, which he had a lot to pull from. But he really humanized those characters. You could attribute some of that to the actors as well. But, um, you know, a lot of those characters are iconic in Lord of the Rings books, but they're not like they're not exactly like they are on screen. They're not nearly as endearing. They're all way more in the books. They're a lot more aloof. Um, it's it's very much more of a regal affair. Um in the books and I thought what he did with the characters you could attribute to him mm -hmm. in my opinion um, and what he was able to handle and I think he carried that through to King Kong and I say I bring that up because as we move forward into the Hobbit trilogy that's something that was not very present um, it was obviously I think that I, I really know I, I know a lot of people don't love uh, the portrayal of Bilbo but I was really happy with of all the characters in the Hobbit I thought that uh the portrayal of Bilbo was the best one. Mm. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Um, but I'm hesitant not to criticize the Hobbit because there's been a lot of criticism about it. I know you have a lot of criticisms. I agree with most of the criticisms. I think my love for Tolkien and the Hobbit story does shine through a little bit more. So I just kind of give it a lot of passes personally. I'll go ahead and admit to that. Um, but another reason that I give jackson a pretty big pass on the hobbit is that the production turmoil was just so great on that set that i almost feel like it's a sad fact but i just cut a lot of slack for the fact that he stepped into that role late and took on impossible odds honestly it felt like i mean he had to turn that into three movies he had studios that were asking him to make it more like Lord of the Rings when it was clearly a children's novel. Um, he's trying to bridge that gap, um, you know, appease different fan bases and do it on little time. Like yeah. if you watch, if you watch the uh, behind the scenes features for the Lord of the Rings, it's this beautiful, jolly band of like amazing people that all love each other and are so excited and so devoted to their craft um, really creating this magic, catching this lightning in a bottle. And if you watch the behind the scenes footage of The Hobbit, it's still interesting and looks fun to everyone else. But every time it shows Peter Jackson, he looks like he hasn't showered or slept in like a week. 
and he looks so tired. And not only this isn't just, you know, me perceiving the way that he looks. He literally says it. I mean, he doesn't say he hasn't showered, but like he's he pretty much like admits he's like, I am so exhausted. I have no idea what's going on. Like everything is frantic and we're just trying to wing this and get through. I mean, I know that um the 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 Battle of the Five Armies end fight scenes or not just the fight scenes, but mainly the big overarching army battles. Uh, the way those were shot were like sending, you know, the assistant directors out just like, go get some footage, go, go get some, like the B roll was so much of just like, just fight, get some, get some good shots. Like it was very much just, I think the production was so rushed and so much of it was being written on the fly that I don't feel like, I mean, obviously the failure is there. But I don't attribute it as much to Peter Jackson as I attribute it to him trying to make the most of his circumstances. Yeah. Well, I think the Hobbit movies definitely suffered from um, that sort of extra baggage that the Lord of the Rings ended up carrying really well. Mm -hmm. Well, no one um, expected anything of the Lord of the Rings either. Yeah. But also, like, the Hobbit had all these other things thrown into it that were clearly meant to make it feel bigger and longer when it never really needed to. Mm -hmm. And I cut it a lot of slack when, when the first one came out, like I really enjoyed the first one. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, you know, I, I cut a lot of the extra stuff that was in there. Um, that people were like, Oh, they're pulling from other, like, uh, other Tolkien writings or whatever. I'm not really familiar with all of that, mm -hmm. but they were pulling stuff that wasn't necessarily in the Hobbit into it. And I was like, I, I kind of cut it slack. I was like, it'll go somewhere. It'll like, you know, move along. But by the third movie, like Gandalf has some side mission that doesn't really go anywhere. It's kind of just extra stuff. And it and it really made the films drag more than they should have. And they should have been a lot lighter. I mean, they were lighter, but they should have been lighter in terms of pacing and more of just a fun adventure uh, with high stakes. But they should have kept that like fun adventure in a in in middle earth feel yeah. to it and parts of the movie got that and parts of the movie just didn't to me and and that it's kind of the same it's kind of the same king kong issue like parts of the movie like parts of the hobbit movies i loved and parts of them i actually liked more than lord of the rings but there's so much extra to it like if peter jackson could just make a two-hour movie <laughs> like that would be great i think because the Hobbit movies never needed to be close to three hours. Yeah, it's I think that that is a somewhat valid uh, criticism. That being said, from my perspective, it's really not. And I've done a gr pretty good deal of research onto into the criticisms of the movies and the movies themselves. Um, the actual problems for me that make that really bring the Hobbit down are not really the bloat or the uh, the adding in of material. Most of the material, barring, I believe, Tariel, the addition of Tariel and her um, arc with uh, Keeley, where most of that added story is at least from Tolkien's own writings. And I think that they actually do a lot for the story. Now, I get that if you're a purist and you're just like, well, The Hobbit was a children's story and I want it to be a children's story, then it's not going to be what you wanted. But that being said, they didn't really have the option to do that. They were stuck between a rock and a hard place where they kind of had to appease certain fans, certain studios in certain ways. And so I think the choice to do it how they did and the Hobbit series did have the lighter tone. It wasn't super childish, but it did have a bit of a lighter tone. I don't think that that was really the problem that brought it down. I think it was the. What really brought it down was the the rushed nature of the project and the fact that I think Peter Jackson just really did not have the time to make it what it could have been as well as the true struggles for me were not the added content. It was the execution of what they did. Like most specifically, they never really handled I don't think he, I don't know if he ever knew or had the time to figure out what to do with the dwarves. They never really differentiated the characters as well as they could have, or as well as they were in the books. And I think that, really cut away for a lot of people because they were especially coming from the Lord of the Rings with such an iconic cast. I thought they casted the Hobbit really well, but um, 
they spent so much time. They spent three movies, but the problem was they didn't spend three movies developing 10 characters. You know, the Lord of the Rings was, it had enough stories to be three movies, but also they spent all three movies developing all of the characters. Whereas I felt like they spent three movies for the Hobbit kind of wandering around developing Bilbo. And I thought they did yeah. a good job of Bilbo. I thought he was I, executed. Well, that's, that's where I feel like the, the added like side stories that were not necessarily in the Hobbit book, um, that were just added material. Like they could have trimmed all that up and focused it on the characters that were actually important to the Hobbit story. Like, I guess that, I guess that's why I don't like the extra baggage in those movies is because they never really develop the main story and you spend all this time on stuff that doesn't feel like it matters in the end. Yeah. It's, and I, I think what Jackson may have done too was, uh, and I, th- I really appreciated this as at the time as a Tolkien fan, I really appreciated it, especially in that there's a lot of this in the Hobbit. He did. It seems like he almost chose setting and culture over character. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if you actually look at what he added in that wasn't in the Hobbit or was in Tolkien's writing, uh, the main thing was just the necromancer plot. It was really yeah. just what was going on worldwide. Obviously, they had to add in Azog the Defiler um, as a villain because and I, I don't knock that because they needed villains. They needed antagonists that were active. Um, that didn't bother me. It was that they spent some time truly meandering very yeah. slowly through the culture, through the world. And it, as a fan of Tolkien, I really appreciated that and I really enjoyed it. But they sacrificed the character development, spending time with each character and getting to know them so much so that in the, by the end of the third movie, it feels like at least seven of like, however many dwarves there are, are just interchangeable. You know, you have, you've grown a decent attachment to Thorin. Um, you know, Feely and Killy are kind of okay. Killy has his little arc with Tariel, which is kind of half baked to begin with. And past that, I mean, think you get a little bit of Balin but he's Balin is a really great character that I feel like he only really gets anything in the third movie and it's kind of just shoehorned in it's and you could you could go on with all the dwarves yeah. it's like it just well, there's uh, there's another major like pacing issue um with the trilogy as a whole um with the way that the dra- like Smaug is implemented because you literally get him at the end of the second movie and then he dies in the first scene of the third movie. And it's just, it feels like kind of weird when you, yeah. if you don't play them, if you don't play all three movies through, um, you know, in one sitting, it, it makes it feel really like just bizarrely put together because you go from like the big threat is this giant dragon. They're going to like kill the dragon I, I actually I like the sort of cliffhanger ending of the second movie, but then you go straight into the third movie and they beat him in the first scene. Yeah, and then it's like, oh, okay, well now, now that we did that, let's switch the story entirely. And I, I also I I never read The Hobbit, so like if that's completely accurate to the book, like that doesn't really matter to me. It doesn't feel right in the yeah, movie. Yeah, it, it, it is. They it, sh- they should have they they needed to pack that into some other way whether you put smaug's death in the second movie or push smaug's entrance to the third movie or whatever it was it should have been done a different way yeah i'm torn on it because i really enjoyed the cliffhanger of the second movie i thought they really handled the the i i think one of the problems was that they had a lot of set pieces they needed to end each movie with a set piece and the hobbit being one book i think that they were they had enough material to stretch it into three movies but they had to still maintain these these movie like structures in that you know uh in the first movie they had to figure out a way to climax so they had to do that big fight with the fire and the trees and the savior and bilbo saving them um i thought they did that really well same thing goes for the second movie they kind of had to have a big set piece to end on they had to have something so the dwarves fighting Smaug was the thing. And I thought that cliffhanger was good. And then the third one, they had the battle of five armies, which they had. The problem was that they kind of had to build in these set pieces. And I just don't know that there was a great way to try and 
puzzle piece at all together because it was originally I, all one story. I think you would have had to cut it into two movies instead of three. Yeah. Which was the original plan. Even then, it still would have been... It still would have been weird, but, using, I, but I think that the I first one could have been trimmed severely. Like, yeah. if you were to rework it entirely, I think they could have trimmed the first one, like, heavily to where actually you had the dragon cliffhanger ending in the first movie. Or you had them kill the dragon at the end of the first movie. Make it feel like a full movie. And then have the second one be the Battle of the Five Armies. Yeah, and make that much more extended. Yeah. I, I, you could have done two three hour long movies. It, it was, it was and made them feel really It felt full. like it might have been. I think it, with what they wanted to do. It felt like it might have been too much for two movies. But too little for three. It's yeah. like there's a weird. There's just a weird push pull aspect. But um. This is the danger that I that I always have to caution when I talk about Lord of the Rings. Is <laughs> I'll just, just start going into all these movies because I'm very passionate and have a lot to say about them. Um, but to move on from the Hobbit films, I guess what I wanted to say was that I can not chalk it up like write it off as it not being a big deal that the Hobbit movies had some problems. I think they're lovable films. Oh, I um, still enjoy them. I, but... I enjoy them, and part of that's just my love for Jackson's style as well as the stories. Um, but I, I do write off some of the struggles of those movies. Um, so the Lovely Bones, did that come that come before The Hobbit, mm-hmm. right? I think it came out in like 2009. I'm going to be honest. I don't even really want to mention that one because I don't even know what happened there. But that movie got rocked. I and saw it a long time ago and I remember thinking that was awful. Yeah. And I, then that, sort of just I don't really understand kind of forgetting it. Um. It had some really bizarre choices but so, from Peter Jackson. Yeah. C- coming to, you know, the original question that we started off with, what's going on? What happened? You know, so after The Hobbit, he got offered Aquaman. He turned it down. Um, since then, he hasn't really done much. He did the um, the war movie. What was it? it was the documentary where he um, colorized. Yeah. And, and, and he added like. What was it called? Uh, they Shall Not Grow they, Old. They Shall Not Grow Old. Um, beautiful movie. Don't know that you can say much because it's not like a narrative movie though. Um, I think obviously it was really well done. It was really well claimed as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and and he's, he's doing the same thing with a, with a new Beatles documentary. Like he's using the same colorizing technique. So, so I guess that's why I'm interested on where he's going in general, where the career is going to, because you know, like I, I guess I didn't really expect him to go in the direction of documentaries. Um, the other thing that we have is somewhere in between all that, we had him doing uh, Tintin, which is one that we kind of just forget about, you know, the animated well, movie. Yeah, well, he, I think Spielberg ended up directing that, but he was. Um, it's, it's very much one of his he- kind of He heavily influenced projects. Yeah. Um, it's, and I think they've, that he wants to do be involved in more. Mm-hmm. They've been kind of talking about it for a while. Um, so that's another odd one, but I only throw it in there because it's, it kind of just complicates his entire legacy. It's like that was actually a really good movie. Um, like, I, I like Tintin. Yeah, it's it's just it's just a really interesting dynamic to to add to the legacy. So he's kind of in this weird limbo place where, um, you know, I hate to bring up Mortal Engines, but um, you know that movie was directed by I believe the director of VFX on the Lord of the Rings movies. Um, but I believe it was. Peter Jackson was producing on the film. I believe Fran Walsh and Philip Boyan were a part of it. I can't remember if they um, wrote it. I thought they did. Um, I think I, th- I think they wrote it. I don't want to mess that up. We'll have to check that. Um, but I, w- while I don't want to, you know, heap the failure of that movie onto Peter Jackson's back, I think that some of it is a little deserved when you plaster his name across every single trailer and pretty much market the movie as his movie, and. If they're writing it, I w- I actually had faith in the movie before it came out in them because not only were they writing it, this is a um, an adaptation of of novels. And now that being said, I tried to read the Mortal Engines novels. Um, they're very young. Uh, it was mostly they weren't bad. There's they, they were honestly too young for me. It felt like uh, I expected them to be a little more YA, a little more relatable across the board. And maybe they were, but I got bored of them. They were short. Really cool idea. Really cool. Um, world, you know, probably well-written novels worth the acclaim that they got. Um, they're fairly popular, but, uh, to talk about the movie, the movie, frankly, in, in regards to the world, I think it had every chance of success. So it's just really strange to me that with his name plastered all over it, with them 
taking part in the writing, how they could not make a cohesive story out of that, because it's a, it's not a very complicated story either. You know, I've I read through most of the first book. It's not as hard as they made it seem like that movie is so all over the place. And honestly, like I, I'm very hesitant to be critical of Peter Jackson because of a little bit of my love for his work. Um, you know, I'm less objective when it comes to it, but like that movie is just bad. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, he did not direct the film, but with the way that they marketed it towards him with the influence that he clearly had on the film, I think it's, it's not unreasonable to kind of scratch your head and lay at least some of the blame on Jackson and Boyens and Walsh. So, um, just a really strange, it's, it's just strange to me how you can go from such a high of the Lord of the Rings to, you know, even if I, like I said, I think that King Kong is iconic. I think that it really did a lot of things really great and it was worth remembering and seeing. And I really think it is a great movie in its own right, in a specific right, but in its own right. Um, you know, I even cut the Hobbit some of the slacks, but it's like he's consistently struggled to not just match the high of Lord of the Rings. I, I don't expect anyone to ever hatch the high, match the high of Lord of the Rings, but I do, I do think that it's weird that we don't see the same through line of truly great writing. And I think that's the problem is that the Lord of the Rings is a great story in its own, but what Jackson did and what they did with writing the films and really adapting them was so tactful on a writing level, like on a microscopic script writing level. It was so well executed. So the fact that even when adapting another property, they could not apply those same principles that they captured so well in the Lord of the Rings and move them over to something like Mortal Engines is just so strange to me. You know, he's so good at so many things and just the inability to capture the purity of storytelling that they did in the Lord of the Rings just really baffles me. And to see now, you know, I'm like, where exactly are we going? You know, I'm, I'm kind of interested. I kind of want him to do another feature film because I want to mm -hmm. see, like, I want him to do a film where he has the time to really write it, to work on it, to, to find the right material that he's passionate about. You know, I mean, even if it's just another King Kong level, uh, solo movie, I want to see, him put forth that same level of passion and have the time and really allow himself to do what he did. Those movies just rocked the entire nation, all the awards. Um, they really let him be self-indulgent on those movies. And you could say that that cut against him a little bit, but, um, Hey, I mean, gotta let the man have some fun if you direct some Lord of the Rings, but, uh, yeah, it's just like, where, where is he? <laughs> where is he going? And, and the interest is like, I guess my question too is, um, you know, is, are the glory days totally over? I mean, I guess you probably won't ever see anything like Lord of the Rings again, but you know, is there no chance to recapture that greatness? And is, does he want to, you know, is he getting old and tired? You know, I mean, I imagine to do doing something like the strange. Hobbit and it not, not being received as well and probably being an exhausting project to work on i think he has expressed could, that just the true exhaustion of the hobbit yeah did. i mean he might just be in like hibernation right now yeah. <laughs> do you think he'll come back though i don't know Do you think he comes back i guess or do you think he's satisfied and he's atop his pile of gold and he's like you know i'm just gonna do some things that i like some i think fun probably things. with i think probably if he finds another project that he's that he's really passionate about he's probably gonna he'll probably come back to do something but i don't think it'll be anything like lord of the rings or uh the hobbit I think if he does something, it, it, it'll it probably be more King Kong style. Because mm. he seemed really interested um, in doing uh, epics. I think that's another reason that King Kong maybe didn't, wasn't as successful um, as, as, um, as it could have been. Is because like a lot of people have completely lost interest in epics in general. Mm -hmm. Like the... That was very much an epic. The genre of like epics are not just like long movies they're like it's like they're their own genre mm -hmm. i mean in the 50s and 60s epics were huge because they would they would make a big deal out of them there were these like road shows where you, you would go you would go see an epic like lawrence of arabia which is like four hours long and there would be an intermission and there would be like 
all the, it, it, it was like, it was, it was an event and an experience. Mm-hmm. But now you go to the theater and you sit in a mildly uncomfortable seat for three hours. Mm-hmm. It's not as like, I think people have lost interest a lot in epics. And I think when he did King Kong, a lot of people are like, yeah, could have been, could have been two hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's kind of why I'm interested. I kind of want to, you know, it's been, I think it's been long enough since the last film that he blockbuster film that he directed that I'm interested to see what he would do in the landscape that we have now in Hollywood, because the landscape is different from what it was in Lord of the Rings, even in the Hobbit, even in King Kong, the, the landscape, like in, and now in the world of superheroes and blockbuster films that we live in now, I'm interested to see if he would adapt to that and help innovate or move it forward or bring back something that was lost. Or if he would just be stuck in the past and not really able to execute in the way that he could back then because times have moved on. Maybe he could do like a 10-part HBO miniseries. I'm not going to lie. Seeing him do an an epic adaptation on like something like HBO would really... I mean, realistically, that's probably probably what what would happen. And I'm not going to lie. I think I with the way on that the table. The, I think with the way that theaters are going right now, you're gonna see a lot of like almost TV show movie hybrids mm-hmm. just coming out of HBO and places like that. I'm not gonna lie. I on I know this isn't anything that has even the chance of happening, but I would love to see him direct the Lord of the Rings Amazon show. Um, you know, like I said, I'd probably prefer it go to HBO. Um, but I would love to see him direct like a even if it was, like you said, not even just like multi-season, but just, you know, like eight to ten episodes of an epic or thing. Because I, I think that would give him the time, assuming he had the time to make it. I think it would give him the time to stew and grow characters and really develop. And I think that now a lot of the feel that Lord of the Rings had, a lot of the self-indulgent, slow burn elements of his style lend themselves to the um to the cutting dramas of the HBO Max series of the world. You know? Mm-hmm. I, I think it'd be really interesting to see him step into the new age of Hollywood and see what he could do with it. You know, because I, I don't feel like he's really done anything that's a part of the new culture. You know, I feel like I've, I feel like when we talk about Peter Jackson films, we I feel like we're talking about a really long time ago, yeah. <laughs> even if it wasn't. But um, yeah, it's 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 a mystery. But did you have anything else to add? I think that covers most of it. Um, I didn't expect to be able to rant for so long about Peter Jackson's work, but um, I'm I am I'm really hopeful that he comes back and. You know, he doesn't have to come back and have like a massive claim to fame, but it'd be really. I think it'd be really cool if he came back and kind of reminded people why they respect him, why they loved him in the first place, because I feel like he kind of gets written off a lot. Probably not in Hollywood. He probably gets offers. You know, he's probably still a well-respected director, but I think among uh, viewers, you know, I think people probably just kind of forget that he's still around. Yeah. And um, I would love to see that come back. But um. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up right there. Um, if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast and the slightly different format of um, going a little deep divey into a new topic or question, just comment below and let us know what you think. And be sure to like the video on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel. And otherwise, I think we'll see you guys next week in the next episode. <laughs>